everybody. Welcome to the WBC number 57. This is round 57 and uh, it's Champions Friday in a few moments. Uh, Tyson Fury will be connected with us. But first, let me introduce Sochi Lagarda. She's the director of WBC University and she has a great message for you. Sochi, welcome. Hi, Victor. Thank you. Hi, Mauricio. Hi, Pepe. It's nice to have you here. We miss you very much in these panels. Well, today is Friday, like you say, Victor, and we are going to close a week with a very interesting concept. Today, we are going to talk about self-efficacy in a sport in the context of the new reality. Self-efficacy refers to people's judgments about their abilities to achieve certain level of performance. Self-efficacy also has a belief is not kept static. It is a reward. It is reward very, very frequently. Almost every day we can change uh, how we perceive things. To help develop self-efficacy in a sport, it is necessary to work on verbal persuasion. And that comes when we open to receive indications or suggestions from other actors and they can be your coach, your psychologist, or even a teammate. Also can be developed by various experience. That happens when the athlete imitates a role model that he identifies as successful. Through the psychology state, it is when the athlete confirms the positive sensation that he has, uh, that he has experienced before. Uh, that takes him to believe in himself. Previous experience is when the athlete has the ability to recap his or her execution. And also, auto-efficacy can happen with the personal sense, and that is when the athlete develops his own interpretation of success. Athletes need to set their own goals according to their level of preparation. They must be self-convinced about priorities not necessary, uh, they have to be associated with the test. And to conclude, in the new reality, you, me, and the athletes must support ourselves in the return to action. Everything must be gradually. We cannot do it everything in one step. The concept of self-efficacy, it has to be it can guarantee us to be effective in that transition, not only in a sport, but in everyday life. With this, I conclude uh, the capsule. I desire everybody a great weekend and a great panel right now. Go ahead, Victor, thank you. Hello, hello, uh, hello champ, can you hear us? Hello, Mauricio, can you hear me? We can hear you perfectly, and you sound great. I'm having great. a problem with the, uh, the camera. Like, it's not showing my face. Can you see me? No, we cannot see you. Uh, uh, do you know how to activate the... Um... Are, you, are you on a computer or your phone? Oh, I've got it now. It's come up access camera. Okay. Okay. <laughs> there you are. Okay. Can you see me now? Perfectly. Looking good. Hey! Can you... oh, yeah. <laughs> Good to see you, Pepe, Mauricio. Yeah, we're good to see you again. Nice to see you, darling. Hi. How are you, champ? How's everything? Uh, how's how's uh, life treating you? Absolutely very well. Since I got back from Vegas, I've been training four times a day, six days a week, keeping in shape, you know. I want to defend this belt. I want it to be the first belt I ever defend. Absolutely. Um, first, I, I want to congratulate you for the activity that you have performed during this uh, difficult time for humanity. Uh, what you and your wife have done has inspired thousands of people around the world. We just saw a, a testimony uh, two days ago from a woman who, thank you, uh, she had been uh, having a lot of problems with alcohol. And through your exercises, She's been away and she's been 30 days clean. What can you tell us about what you do every day? Every day, me and my wife, we do a live workout on Instagram for all the people who, who are stuck at home and maybe can't go outside. Um, 
and it's a positive movement, you know, we've been doing it now. Hello, yeah. We lost it, now, now you're back. Ah, there we are, WBC. Okay. Yes, so we do this uh, movement and it's a workout for people at home who can't go out and can't do much and it gives them something to get up for in the morning and it also helps me and it helps others as well. So it's absolutely, uh, it's fantastic for us. Me and my wife, we really love it. It's brought us closer as a couple and it's also helped a lot of people around the world. How has your wife influenced Tyson Fury? The, the man, the, the person, Tyson Fury. You know, my wife um, has been a rock for me over the years. Um, it's no secret when I had all my uh, problems, mental health, uh, alcoholism. She was there for me, stood by me. She was a rock for me throughout. Um, and she's, she's always been there. We've been together from being kids, 15 years old and 16 years old. And we're still together all this time later. Uh, 32 this year and she's 31, so... Uh, it's been a, you get less for you get less for murder, that's for sure. <laughs> so she's your, she's your sweetheart from school, from, yes. from the young age. Yes. Look at that. <laughs> can you see the pictures that we're showing? Yes, I can see the picture. That was when we were only young, about 18 years old there. Wow. Uh, we presented the Heroes for Humanity Awards to both of you for this work and, uh, I'm just so very proud of what uh, you represent, what your wife uh, and you represent as a couple, what you represent as a WBC heavyweight champion of the world. And uh, we could not have a better representative. And I'm very, very proud of you. Thank you very much, guys. You know, I'm very honored to be an ambassador and heavyweight champion of the WBC. It was the only belt that I didn't win during my career. Um, and I finally got hold of it at the end. And now I, I intend to make 20 title defences of the okay. WBC crown. <laughs> yeah, you got to break uh, all the records from, from Ali, Larry Holmes, even Joe Lewis, the all-time yes. record of defences. Yes, I, um, I, I see these challenges today, and I, I've already beat the toughest one in Deontay Wilder. So just stack them up and I'll knock them down. Okay. Uh, there's a few... You know, uh, when we announced you were, we were having you in, in the WBC Talks, it just created huge excitement. And we have a few questions from, from fans. Yeah. One, they would like to know who are your top five current heavyweight uh, fighters? Who do you think are the top five current? Yes, uh, obviously me, number one. Uh, number two, I say Wilder. Number three, I say Joshua. Number four, I say Alexander Usek. Number five, I say Dylan White. You know, it has been a long time since there has been excitement in the heavyweight division. Now, yes. great champion, great contenders, and great possible matches. So we look forward for many years of great excitement. How yeah, about you? Me too, yeah. Yeah, please. You know, there's a lot. There's there's a lot of good contenders in the top 15, the WBC, and a lot of good guys who'll be moving up from the top 50 to the top 20 to the top 10 in, in a year or so. So I look forward to all the challenges. Um, how about your top five all-time heavyweights? This is a good one, and um, this is probably a strange one because there's a, a few guys in here that other people probably wouldn't put in the list. But my all-time five, not including myself, is um, in no specific order. Um, I'd say Muhammad Ali. Um, I'd say Larry Holmes. I'd say Lennox Lewis. I'd say Joe Lewis. And who else would I put in in that five? I'd probably put Rocky Marciano in there as well. Um, because he wasn't beaten 49 and 0. Well, uh, I was talking a few days ago about Marciano. You know, the difference in weight of today's heavyweights and the uh, pre WBC era, Marciano was like 190, 195 pounds 
185 pounds. And yeah. He, he could punch. What a, what a, I mean, he, he, he could be a champion in, in today's boxing. Yeah, he could be a champion in the light heavyweight division and the cruiserweight division because that's the weight of him. Like the weight today, like my weight for my last fight was 272 pounds yeah. and six foot nine inches tall and very athletic. You know, even Wilder's six foot seven and 232. Joshua's six foot six and 242. You know, the, the guys of today are, are like dinosaurs compared to the old time greats from the mm -hmm. past. But then again, uh, Mauricio, every time with time it evolved, everybody gets bigger and stronger and faster. Absolutely. This, um, is, this is part of the new style of uh, new technologies, the uh, nutrition. Uh, you know, now, now uh, uh, fighters have strength and conditioning coach and uh, even a psychologist. And, you know, a lot of things are coming into place, you know, nutrition. So yes. Different, different, not a different sport, but a different era. I, I don't know if, uh, do you believe uh, the boxers are, are getting stronger with all these I, cool developments? I, belie I, I believe everything evolves. Like if you look at the world's fastest man from 10 years ago, compared to Usain Bolt today, it's a hell of a difference, like really quicker. If you look at the world's fastest car from 20 years ago, and look at the world's fastest car today, everything's got bigger and faster. If you look at a big truck from 20 years ago, one from today, they're all bigger and faster. But like you said there, Pepe, you, you touched on something really good. Um, you said nutritionist, strength and conditionist, a psychologist, some of these guys are having. But back in the day, 30, 50, 100 years ago, they never even had this sort of stuff. Some of them didn't even eat food. There's a famous fighter called a Cinderella man, Jimmy Braddock. He didn't fight. He didn't eat for three days before he fought Max Bear uh, for the World Heavyweight Championship. So, you know, we're very privileged to live in this era and to be able to have all the, the nutritionists, the strength and conditioning work, not have to go to a full-time laboring job um, and be a full-time professionals and take, take it um, very, very serious and very professional. Uh, the guys back in the day, they, uh, I often heard stories of, of fighters having uh, brandies in between rounds and stuff. <laughs> yeah. we, have, we have quite stories about uh, some fighters after making the weight. You know, the weight uh, in those yeah. days was the day of the fight. They would yeah. make the weight and they would go and have brandy and, and rum to get uh, warm up for the fight. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you I'll tell you guys something yeah that you probably don't know uh, when I was boxing Deontay Wilder in Los Angeles uh, in 2018 I, I, it was the night before the fight and I, I had this urge to go downstairs and have a beer so I thought you know what I'm fighting for the heavyweight championship of the world my body's telling me I want a beer I'm going to go downstairs and have one yeah. so I calls up my buddy who organises things for me Tim and I says, Tim, meet me downstairs in five minutes at the bar. He said, what? I said, meet me downstairs in five minutes. So I go downstairs and I get two beers, one for me, one for my buddy, Tim. And he says, what are you doing? You're fighting for the heavyweight championship of the world in the morning, uh, in tomorrow night. And I was like, listen, the old time greats, they used to have brandies and they used to get absolutely sackless drunk before championship fights. So I thought, if I can't have a beer, I'll be right. So I ended up having a beer and I, I felt good, went to bed, got an early night, and I felt great the next day and I put up a good fight. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> That's a good story. Uh, were there people in the bar? Yeah, there were people in the bar and they were like, hey, champ, what's happening? Can I buy you a drink? And I was like, no, thank you. I'm, uh, I'm fighting in the morning for the championship of the world tomorrow <laughs> evening, sorry. You didn't know how to wrestle any of them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a classic. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of people in the bar, so you can imagine how hectic it was. And for them all to see me walking down, having a, a beer at the bar, it was like, wow, this guy's crazy. <laughs> you are, you're unique. You are a character. Yes. And, um, tell us about your life in general, before boxing, uh, the gypsy thing, the gypsy lifestyle, your grandparents, yes. your parents. What can you... Yes. Oh, well... What I am is the Gypsy King, and the Gypsy um, lifestyle and race goes back to the first century, um, goes back a thousand years. 
Um, and they travel throughout the world. There's gypsies in every single country in the world. That's why I have a, I have a very, very, very big following, whichever country I go to. If I boxed in Jamaica or if I boxed in Spain or Italy or Mexico, anywhere, then there'd be gypsies in that country and they'd come to support me. Um, that's my granny and grandfather right there. Um, there are nomadic people. The, the gypsies, um, there are nomadic people. They like to travel around. They used to travel around in horse-drawn carts and their wagons, like you used to see on the old uh, cowboy and Indian pictures, films, um, sort of similar to like that. And yeah, they, um, the lifestyle is, though, it's always been about fighting. For always, We've always been oppressed people. Uh, we've always been, we suffered racism, even today. Even as heavyweight champion of the world, I suffer with racism on a daily basis. And people would look at me and say, well, you're a white guy. How can you suffer racism? Well, the racism towards gypsies is, it seems to be the only acceptable form of racism throughout the world. And nobody mm. does anything. So, yeah, we, uh, we keep ourselves to ourselves. We're hardworking people, God-fearing people. But we love to fight. You know, I suppose we're similar to Mexican people. God-fearing, honorable, love to fight. And we've been fighting all our lives. Um, even from, from a little boy, I, I was brought up around boxing, fighting. My dad was a fighter, uncles, grandparents. Everybody boxed or fought. Um, so it's bred in us automa like it's automatically. All the boys, the, the males throughout the community and all that, they all can box. And a lot of them have won national championships in many different countries, even in America, in England, everywhere. Um, so we grow up around boxing. You know, in England, the, the national sport is soccer. But uh, with the gypsies, we, we grow up fighting. If you go to, like, the national championships um, for all the ages, in every category, say there's 11 or 12 different weight categories, then nine or 10 of them will be travellers in the final. Wow. Yeah. So, but what happens with them, usually 80% of the time, they get to 16 years old, 17, to when they, they get a bit older, and then they, go, they get married. They get married young, and they have to provide for their wife, and then they have children young. And before they know it, they're 20 years old, and they've got three kids. And uh, the, the, what, the way you describe the similarity with the Mexican uh, people, uh, Mexicans through the Aztecs, the Mayans, the, the way the culture came about, they were fighters, they were warriors. Yes. And uh, I could see something special uh, shining in your eyes when you got the Mayan belt. Uh, yes, I absolutely time. loved it. I got that Maya belt and I, I actually, I'm going to show you because I have many, many, many belts. But at the top of my list, at the top of my display cabinet, how do I turn this camera around? Zoom in. Oh, there we go. At the top, there's all the other belts. There's the Ring Magazine belt. And there's my Mayan belt right at the top. Look, if you look, there's all the other belts in the cabinet, every single belt and boxing. But there's my uh, green Mayan belt right at the top where she belongs. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So, yes, um, it's very special to me. And um, when I heard that I was going to be fighting for the WBC Mayan belt, um, I thought it was a great honor because... I became the first non-Mexican person to, uh, to fight for this uh, prestigious belt. Um, and I, I've even got the nickname uh, El Rey Hidanos. Yes. And I've got it on my phone. And it, on my uh, phone, it's my uh, phone name. Uh, <laughs> but I have, a, I have a Mexican coach, uh, Jorge Capitella, in Las Vegas as well. And I have uh, quite a few Mexican friends in, in Las Vegas, in and around Vegas. Yes. But, uh, but the, you know, the, the, the thing about, about uh, fighting is also why you fight. You know, a lot of people just fight for money, just for fame. You fight also with, with, a, with a mission, with a purpose, uh, not specifically a mat in, in, in material. You have like a more of a, also a spiritual vision. 
in yes. the world. Yes, Pepe. I am, um, you know, as a heavyweight champion of the world, I, I've become a two-time heavyweight champion, lineal champion. I've won every belt. I've made quite a bit of money out of boxing. But, you know, some fighters, they, they get a few few uh, dollars and they, they just go crazy. They buy all shiny things and whatever. And by the time they look around, they've spent all the money and they're back to where they started. But for me, the assets, the material assets, is not what it's about for me. I live in a normal house. I drive a normal car. Me and my wife and kids, we do normal lives. And that's how I like to keep it grounded. Why I box now? Uh, in the beginning, it was about being heavyweight champion of the world. Um, and nothing was ever going to stop me from becoming the heavyweight champion of the world. And then I beat Klitschko and won all the belts, become the unified champion. Um, but when I made the return in 2018, it was going to be about something different for me. It was going to be about helping people who were suffering with mental health problems. It was going to be about showing the world that anything is possible. Because I came back from just over 400 pounds to get back to fighting fit again within within about eight months' time, and I was in the ring again fighting. And I was so down, I was suicidal, I was depressed on a daily basis. Um, I didn't want to live anymore. Um, I, I suffered with bipolar and anxiety, um, depression. And I wanted to show more than anything that anything is possible because people told me it was impossible to come back. They told me that I'd never box again. They told me I was too fat, I'd gone too far. And I wanted to prove to the world that with the right mindset and dedication, anything's possible. Even if you reach him for the stars, you will get there eventually. You might need a rocket ship to get to the stars. Yeah. But eventually, if you aim high enough, you're going to hit one. And that's, that's what I'm doing in this time, you know. I box and I fight for people, not just for money and fame and glory, because it's all quite pointless, because this is a short life. And it... Um, it's about, for me, it's about leaving a mark and a legacy and helping people around me today. Um, and being a good person and inspiring and helping others around the world who, who are suffering, who are oppressed, who are down, who do need a helping hand. And maybe when I keep talking about it all the time and doing um, interviews and videos about mental health and stuff like that, then maybe just one person might see it and think, you know what, I'm going to change my life today because I saw that guy do it and I know it's possible. And, and that's what I aim for. I aim to help others who are, who are down and who don't think there's a way back. And, you know, I'm like a shining light to people around the world who are suffering with mental health problems because there's always a way out and there's always a way back to where you want to go. You just got to find the right path to the promised land. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, uh, in, indirectly, without knowing it, you have saved Jorge Capetillo, for example. His gym... Uh, was in, in the verge of uh, having extreme problems and you go in and do an exhibition and you do a, a, an event to save his gym. And now he's in your corner. Now he's in the corner of the heavyweight champion of the world. So you are always looking on, on ways to do, uh, to touch people and change their lives directly and indirectly. You must feel very, very profoundly proud of yourself. You know what? I, I love to help other people. Um, I'm a God-fearing man, um, and I like to do good things to others. I, I'd rather do good things to people than do bad things to them. You know, there's a lot of badness goes on in this world, and I don't need to add to it. You know, we've all had our problems, and, and God knows I've had many problems in myself, and I probably will continue to have problems. But the thing is, it's about doing, doing good things and trying to help other people as best as we can. You know, and even in these big fights, big world championship fights, I'm, I'm helping people because they're getting entertained in these big fights. They're, they're tuning in to watch them, people from all hours in the morning. Um, when I box in Las Vegas, it's 5 a.m. in the morning here in, in the UK. And everyone stays up to watch and around the world. So, you know, I, I just hope that I can be good for the sport. I hope I can breathe life back into it as I've done over the last few years and give it a real buzz again, the heavyweight division, because when Klitsch goes at the belts, no disrespect to the guys that were great champions, but there wasn't a real buzz around the heavyweight division. It was classed as, as boring and um, it was classed as like the heavyweight championship of the world needs to be in the West. Um, that's for sure. It, need, it needs to be in like North America or, or the UK or, or somewhere like that. When it's in Europe, people, like the American people, the Mexican people, the British, the Irish, they don't sort of 
it doesn't mean as much to them. Um, it's, it also almost devalues the heavyweight championship of the world. And now that now that it was in America with Deontay Wilder, he's back in the UK with me, and you've got Anthony Joshua. It seems to be that the heavyweight division is thriving back to the to the uh, late eighties and nineties when you had like Evander Holyfield, Mike Tyson, Larry Holmes, um, Lennox Lewis. Um, back to those days, and that's what I I hope to to take it back to, back to the glory days of heavyweight boxing. And I, I've proved that I'm willing to step up to the plate and give the fight, the fans the fights they want to see. Because as we all know that uh, Wilder was trying to fight Anthony Joshua for two years and there was uh, a lot of money on the table, $80 million to be precise, and they turned it down. Um, and I was here, I was £400 plus, and I was thinking to myself, I need to come back, I need to fight Deontay Wilder almost to defend my country type of thing because a lot of the a lot in the boxing game they're saying oh the British heavyweights they're all cowards and whatever and I'm sitting here thinking I've been retired for nearly three years 400 pounds I'm going to make a comeback and I'm going to knock Wilder out within six months I was back back in the ring um, I'm back fighting Deontay Wilder um, for the first fight and I proved that like I said before to, to Pepe I proved that with the right mindset anything is possible and I wasn't even, I wasn't ready at the time for that first Wilder fight. I sort of jumped into it hasty. But I knew, I knew then that when he couldn't beat me, when he couldn't do anything with me then, I outboxed him all the way. Um, I knew then, like, when I'm match fit and ready, I have a couple more fights, he would not live with me. And that, that proved to be the fact. I absolutely annihilated him. Yeah. Will you recall in your darkest hour, in your lowest yeah. moment what ignited what said okay enough is enough i'm gonna get out from this and, and change my life well i'll was tell you what happened specific? yeah there was there was a specific turning point there was a couple actually there was two i'll start with the first one um i was in a high-powered car ferrari to be precise and this day i was very down and depressed and i was gonna kill myself i decided i was going to commit suicide by smashing this car into a bridge. And I picked the bridge out and I knew where I was going to go. It was a familiar road to me. And I got the car up to a very high speed and I was aiming towards this motorway bridge, highway bridge. Um, and I got within maybe 100 feet of the bridge, 200 feet. And something told me, in, I, I almost heard a voice. Maybe I did hear a voice. I'm not saying I didn't, but I heard it as clear as we're talking now. And it said to me, it said, Tyson, do not do this. You're going to destroy your family's lives. Your kids are going to grow up with no, no father. You're going to make things very, very difficult. And I immediately slammed on the brakes and pulled the car over. And people say, before you die, you see your life flash in front of you. I didn't see no life flash in front of me. All I could think about was leaving the kids with no father and uh, they have them to grow up, grow up without me. So I pulled the car over and I, I could feel my heart beating out my chest. And I could feel tears coming down my face. At the time, I didn't know this was happening. I was all in erratic uh, mood. And um, I thought to myself, this is the first time I need to get help. Because I, I'd suffered with anxiety and depression from being a young boy, but never, never uh, was diagnosed. Never went to see a doctor until I got to 28 years old. Um, so I went to see the doctor and at first I didn't think the doctor thing was going to be for me. I wasn't um, convinced about it. And I went to see this doctor and I spoke to him um, and I told him about what was going on and all that. And, he's, I, and he told me that I wasn't the only person in the world who had these problems. Because at the time when you're not educated on this matter, which I wasn't, I never had a clue about it. I just knew that I would feel down and I feel bad all the time, ill. And I didn't want to live. And he said, you need medication, you need help. And I was like, I'm all, I don't want any medication because my grandfather, he had medication and he never got off it. He was on it his whole life. He was addicted to medication. These um, antidepressant drugs or whatever they were. So I didn't want to take the medication. I was adamant that I could do it through training and a healthy lifestyle. And he said, I'm telling you, you're going to struggle without medication. I was like, no, I'm going to come and see you and speak to you uh, once or twice a week. And I'm going to do this through healthy eating and diet. And I believe it was um, 2017. 
Halloween night. Um, I went out, was dressed up as a skeleton, a glow-in-the-dark skeleton suit. Um, and I was, I was in a bar and I was feeling very down and I, I was in, I was, it was a moment of madness and I was having a beer and I thought to myself, I, for one second, I thought to me, I looked around me and I could see all young people at the beginning of their lives. And I thought to myself, what are you doing here? Go home right now. And I put the beer down and I left immediately. And I come home around about 8, 8 p.m. And, and Paris would usually expect me not to come home at all or come home at five in the morning at that time. So she said, who's that? I said, it's me. I'm going upstairs. And I went upstairs, I took the suit off and... I got down on my knees. I was in my underpants. And I got down on my knees at 28 stone in weight, 400 pounds. I was heart attack material. And I was, I was crying out to God to help me because I knew I couldn't do it on my own. I knew that it wasn't possible anymore unless I wanted to get addicted to these drugs, these uh, antidepressant drugs and more medication. I, I knew I couldn't do it on my own. So I, I remember reading George Foreman's autobiography and I remember that, that there's, a, there's a part in his book where he talks about he had a nephew who was very ill and he got on his knees and he begged God to help him. Um, and he was down there for a while. And I, I thought, he, he worked for George. It's going to work for me. So I got on my knees and I was crying out to God on my knees. And it, it felt like I was down there for an hour. But maybe I was down there for like 20 minutes or something. And I poured my heart out. Uh, everything I wanted to say, everything I had on my chest, I let it all out in the room. I was in a dark room on my own. If ever someone had seen me, they think this guy's crazy, put him in an institute. And I got up off the floor. Even though I was 400 pounds, I felt like a welterweight. I felt like I had the weight of the world on my shoulders when I went down. But when I got back up, I was elevated. I was back. And I said to Paris, I called out to my wife and I said, Paris, she said, what? I said, tomorrow morning, I'll start the regain mission. I'll become a heavyweight champion of the world again. But she been used to me saying this i was the boy who cried wolf every time i got drunk and had a couple of beers i'd be shadow boxing in the living room saying i'm going to be an heavyweight champion of the world again so she never took it serious but this one night i'd not had anything to drink i was sober as a judge and i meant it with conviction and she believed me and the next day i started the regain mission to become heavyweight champion of the world again and i phoned up my trainer and i said i'm ready to train now and I phoned up uh, Frank Warren. I said, I'm ready to make a comeback, Frank. He goes, yeah. He said, we'll power the comeback. Return of the match. And then that day I got my uh, sweatsuit on. And I went, I intended to jog one mile, just one. And I didn't get, I didn't get half a mile without stopping. And I, um, I stopped and I walked. And as I was walking, I was looking on Instagram at some videos. And I saw a video that Deontay Wilder had done. And he said that he could knock out Mike Tyson in one round in his heyday. And I thought, this, this is disrespectful because Mike Tyson's 50 odd years old and Deontay Wilder's a young champion in his era. And I thought, you know what? For that one comment, I'm going to come back and I'm going to knock you out. And he also said some stuff about me as well. He said, oh, he's, he's, a, he's fat and he, um, he'll never make a comeback. He's too far gone. So... I owe, actually, I owe Deontay Wilder for actually bringing me back and giving me more inspiration to return, as well as God. Um, and I, I never stopped. And from this day to that day, I've never stopped training. I've trained every single day since uh, the 1st of November, 2017. 1st of November, after Halloween, of course. Yes. Do you, do you believe in omens and premonitions and things like that? Um, it depends what you mean and what type of omens and premonitions. Let me tell you why. <laughs> Go on. Before the fight, uh, on the, in a press conference, I don't know if you remember that you were in the middle of the, of, of the stage. So yeah. Yelling and everybody was around and blah, 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 blah. All of a sudden, a, a, a pigeon came flying very close. True, yes. And, it, and then it, it, it went to, 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 the, to the stands over there on your side. So for me, without, I mean, taking skills, taking favoritism, taking, taking everything out of, the, uh, out of the question, the dove went to your side. For me, 
that was an omen, that was a premonition that you were going to win the fight. You know, I, in, my, in my crazy world, that's how it worked. That's how I, you know, I, I said, okay, that's it. He's going to win. You know, the world works in mysterious ways. And, and I wouldn't say that I don't believe in things like that because I do. You know, I, I, us gypsies, we believe in uh, stuff like that. We believe that animals can, can uh, bring warning signs and stuff, especially birds. Yeah. It's quite fitting that you say the dove because, like, we believe that birds carry messages of warning. Well, sure. Um, and uh, I've, had, I've had a few birds tell me a few different things. It sounds crazy. But um, we believe that if a bird flies in, in a building where you are, then it, it, it's, a, it's a sign that uh, something, either something bad's going to happen or something yeah. good's going to happen to yeah. the individual it happens to. Mm -hmm. Like I say, it flew right past me. I, I, I literally moved out of the way of it. Yeah. Got that close to me. <laughs> and, and since then, for a long time, you know, wild birds have been flying right next to me and sitting down on the floor. I kid you not. I no. kid you not. I, like, I've even got a picture that I'll, I'll send to, to your phone number in a minute. And I'm going to show you. I was sat on my balcony outside and a little tiny bird, a wild bird, it flew within three feet away from me. And they never come that close. Mm -hmm. And I'm having big, big birds, crows and pigeons and everything fly right near me. So maybe there's something in it. I do not know. <laughs> it's just a blessing. You know, it's, it, 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 you know, you, you can't break your head trying to figure out what the meaning is. Just enjoy something special happening in that moment. You know, I mean, for many people, it would have a, a message, but, but this, this uh, uh, for me, it didn't before the fight. So uh, it, was, it was very, very, uh, I don't know, very strange. My brothers don't understand what the way I think and, and things I see, and I'm always looking at clouds and patterns and things like that. So. <laughs> <laughs> very interesting, very interesting. <laughs> where, where does the name Tyson comes? Well, the name Tyson comes from the great fighter Mike Tyson. Um, when I was born in 1988, August 1988, Mike Tyson had just won a big fight and he was in his heyday. And my dad said, I'm going to call him Tyson because I came into the world uh, eight weeks premature and I died three times as a, as a newborn baby. And I was very small. I only weighed at one pound in weight. And the doctor said that I wouldn't live. I wouldn't make it. And my dad said, he's going to make it and he's going to grow up to be nearly seven feet tall and 20 stones, which is about uh, 300 pounds. And he said, I'm going to call him Mike Tyson. I'm going to call him Tyson after the great heavyweight because my dad's all-time hero is Mike Tyson. And he said, I'm going to call him after the greatest heavyweight that's ever lived, Tyson. And he's going to grow and he's going to be strong and he's going to be the heavyweight champion of the world. That's what, exactly what he said. And wow. I grew up to be uh, strong and, uh, and big and become the heavyweight champion of the world. After being named after Mike, I actually got to meet him and uh, become good friends with Mike Tyson over the years. What, what, what did you say about Mike? He's a wonderful man. I, I, Mike Tyson is a, a dear friend and, and he is an inspiration to many. Uh, now you, you, you seem to be getting along very well you had him your podcast, so... Yes, yes. Uh, Mike's a great guy. You know, he has a lot of experience. He's been through a lot of trauma in his life, a lot of highs and lows. And I think now he's in a real stable place and he's doing absolutely fantastic for his, uh, for his life and his family. I wish him all the luck in the world and success. He's doing very well. He's doing great. And it's boxing that has brought him back to feel, feeling well. He lost all this weight and he's doing sensational. Um, yeah, for sure. I'd advise anybody if they want to lose weight and get fit and uh, control mental health, then, then boxing, whether it's keep fit classes, boxer size or actual boxing technique of bags and drills. It's absolutely fantastic cardio, fantastic for strength work, especially for, for people who've never done it before. It absolutely makes you lose quick weight quick. And it gives you, um, it releases an endorphin in your brain, a feel good factor. Um, who would you say is your boxing hero? When you, when you were growing up, when you were 
uh, starting doing uh, your first uh, things in boxing. Who was, who has been your inspiration in, from the ring? My boxing hero. Um, I always liked and watched Muhammad Ali growing up as a kid. I used to go to these um, like car boot sales. I don't know if you have them in, in, uh, in Mexico and America, like people sell stuff they don't want out the back of a car. Yeah. Um, and I used to go to these places and things would be cheap on them. And I used to go to these and I used to collect um, VCR videotapes of old boxing, anything boxing, old time, black and white movies, black and white boxing fights, right the way up to new ones, as new as we could get. And I'd studied heavyweights and I'd sort of practiced different bits of moves from different fighters. But I always liked, I liked Larry Holmes, I liked Muhammad Ali. Um, and I also like, this is a strange one, people don't get it when I say this, but I liked Michael Spinks. Spinks for me was a very te technician boxer. He was absolutely fantastic at moving and putting punches together and coming at awkward angles. Um, I know he lost that one fight to Mike Tyson in one round and he's judged for it. But I think, I think he already lost that fight before he even entered the ring. But apart from that fight, the fights he had as a, a light heavyweight, and cruiserweight and heavyweight, um, I thought he was a very, very talented uh, fighter. Do you like Snoop Dogg? Snoop Dogg? Yes. Yes, I like Snoop Dogg. Yeah, I like the music. I, li I listen to all different types of music. Um, anything from hip-hop, R&B, rap, to country music. To dance and iron, but anything. Do you have a favorite uh, group or a favorite song? My favorite uh, singer is Elvis Presley or Tom Jones. Elvis, okay. <laughs> and uh, I obviously like Viva Las Vegas for obvious reasons. <laughs> <laughs> when I when I when I met when I met you uh, in here in Los Angeles, uh, I, I gave you a WBC cap with the WBC yes. there. Then I, we walked into the media workout and, uh, you know, everybody puts all kinds of music, very loud music. But then you, you, you ask uh, uh, you guys to turn on the music and it was Tom, Tom Jones. And yes. I thought it was great. I enjoyed that. Like, you know, I always suffer in, 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 when, <laughs> in the workouts, but this I enjoyed so much. This, oh, this yeah. is very different, very different. So I, I really well, enjoyed it. You know, I, I am a very different person to most boxers there, uh, Pepe. Like you yeah. said, I, would, I, I can work out to Tom Jones and, and country music and soul music and jazz music. Mm -hmm. um, I don't need all the, uh, the head banging music. I don't mind it. I don't, don't, I don't dislike it. But I, I can easily train to, to Elvis, even love songs, yeah. uh, anything. But yeah, I do like Tom Jones, and I, I like training to Tom Jones. And the guys in the gym, the sparring partners, and the trainers, they're like, this, this British guy, he is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and then, the, to top it all off, like, uh, I, I've got to have been the first heavyweight champion in history. Got to have been the first heavyweight champion in history to walk out to Patsy Klein. Crazy. <laughs> Tell me that uh, bye bye Miss American Pie. Yes, was Don McCoy. Was that planned? Would you sing it in the ring? That has, I mean, decades from now, people will see that uh, video. They will see that moment. That yes. was a uh, hum humongous moment in the sport uh, you sing that song that was tremendous how did that come about you had it planned or no nothing planned with me Mauricio nothing's planned everything's like spontaneous um, so after, after fights I usually sing songs it's sort of what I do after the victory I sing and people expect it People expect it from me to sing songs. And I thought to myself, I, lo I do love that song, Ran, uh, the Don McLean American Pie. And I thought to myself, you know what? We're in America. Let's sing Bye Bye Miss American Pie. And it's a great classic. And everybody knows it to join into and sing along. So it was, uh, I look back at the video and it's going to be, like you say, it will be an epic moment for me in my life and time. And people remember the day the heavyweight championship changed hands and, and Tyson Fury sung Bye Bye Miss American Pie. <laughs> uh, what is your favorite TV show? Favorite TV show? Um, 
I, I did watch the uh, the series Game of Thrones. Uh huh. Um, I enjoyed that. I like all that sort of um, kings and queens and castles and sword fighting and that sort of stuff. I like them type of movies. Um, I'm watching this one now on Netflix called Rain, and it's about um, the British monarchs going back to the uh, 1500s, like Mary, Queen of Scots, and Queen Elizabeth and stuff like that. And that's a really good um, uh, series to watch. I don't know if you get it over there. Um, in California, but maybe you do. Um, and I also watched this one called Jamestown. It was about the um, first settlers in Virginia when they first came to to the New World. Mm -hmm. Oh, that, that, that would be nice. I, I'm watching one that is called Dark. It's a German series and it's uh, mind blowing. It's I'm very into it. Every night I watch with my wife Two or yes. three episodes. Yes, we're the same. Me and my wife, we get the kids to bed and we try and get two or three in every single night. It's sort of like a ritual. I'll have a cup of tea, a cup of hot tea, and we'll sit down and we'll watch the uh, the TV show. And the thing is, though, I can get addicted to them. I can put one on, two on, and I could sit there all day and watch them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, tell us something about the magic man. Frank the magic Warren. Man. Mr. Frank Warren. He's a Hall of Fame boxing promoter. Um, he's promoted all the top uh, British guys, even promoted Mike Tyson for a bit as well. Um, and, you know, when I was down and out, um, there was a lot of offers from different people, um, from Golden Boy Promotions, from uh, from Germany, from Sauland, and from Eddie Earn, Matchroom. And there was a few different people. But, you know, Frank has always delivered for me. Um, he delivered me the Klitschko fight. He made me mandatory for that fight when I boxed Derek Chisora for the mandatory position. Um, and he got me a couple more fights. So I I always thought I'm better with Frank Warren that who I've dealt with and, and worked with in the past. Um, so we had a good relationship. Um, and Frank's delivered time and time again. And he brought this time on the comeback, he brought a new player to, to boxing, especially British boxing. And the name is BT Sports. Now, BT, BT in the UK, British Telecom, they had all the uh, telephone lines, internet lines, everything um, in the UK for like 50 years, 60 years. So they're very big players and they thought they would bring out a new sports channel called BT Sport. Um, Frank Warren introduced me to the, the head guy at BT Sport and we sat down and I told him what I was going to do. And... Frank and BT Sport backed me and they made, made it possible um, right up until the, the Wilder fight, the first one. That was all made possible by BT and Frank. And then after that, I was, uh, I was at home minding my own business. I get a call from a top rank in ESPN. Um, we spoke to Frank and we all agreed it, was a, it would be a good move for me. Um, to move my uh, fight base to America and, and, and be exclusive to fighting in America now. And I, I came to America uh, in the... Uh, I boxed there before against Steve Cunningham in New York at Madison Square Garden in 2013. Um, but my first fight in... It was in Las Vegas, uh, 2000, and it could have been June 19 against Tom Schwartz. And I brought uh, entertainment factor as well as action to Las Vegas for the first time in a long time from a heavyweight division. And it created uh, quite a buzz. And I think ESPN were really happy. So they got me a few fights. And working with Bob Arum, by the way, has been an absolute dream. Um, Bob, as everything he's ever said, he delivered. Um, top rank of Bob, they've been absolutely exceptional. And he, all the guys at uh, ESPN as well, everything that we said and talked about, these guys delivered, so I'm very, very happy. Um, and up from my behalf, everything that I said, I've delivered too. So we work as a great team, you know, uh, all the guys and well, everyone in the office, everyone does a fantastic job. And between us all, between Frank Warren, between Top Rank, KSPN, MTK Global, we all have a little input, a little input on, on what's going on and, and where everything's going. And it's absolutely a fantastic dream team. You know, Bob Arum, uh, 
he will be turning 90 years old next year. Yeah. And we're going to do, we're going to dedicate 2021 as a year of boxing. We're going to do many celebrations. And to see Bob Arum so active, so passionate, so clear-minded, uh, you must have great stories about Bob Arum. Yes. Um, Bob flew over to me, and I didn't know how old Bob was until he told me. He said, I'm 88 years old. That was in 2019. And he says, I fly, I fly all over the world. And uh, he's got so much energy. You know, I've never, ever seen a work ethic like Bob Arum. Absolutely fantastic person to be around so positive. Uh, we went for a meal in London when he came over to see me for the first time. And I asked him, I said, Bob, I said, what's the motivation? I said, at nearly 90 years old, what motivates you to, to want to be a promoter? And it was like, I started off in the game with the best heavyweight champion, Muhammad Ali. Uh, I'd like to go out with the best heavyweight champion, Tyson Fury. And from that moment, I believed in him. And I knew he could deliver because he delivered so many, so many big fights. Yeah, he's a legendary, legendary, unbelievable. Yes, and, for uh, sure. I hope to have many, many more big fights promoted by Bob Arum, for sure. Yeah. How was your experience to train with Emmanuel Stewart at the Crunk Gym in Detroit? Fantastic. You know, I, uh, I was a young kid when I went down, I was 21 years old. And this is an absolutely crazy story. Um, I was, it was 2009. I was 21 years old. I was the English heavyweight champion. I think I had 12 fights unbeaten. 12 and 0. Um, and I thought to myself, you know what? I want to go to America and train. And I want to go to Emmanuel Stewart, the world's greatest trainer at that time, legendary trainer. So I got on a plane and I, I went to the shop and I said, right, Detroit, please. So I got on a plane from Manchester to Detroit. I didn't even know where I was going. Went on my own to Detroit from Manchester as a young kid. Um, I flew into Detroit airport and I went to a, a cab driver and I said, can you take me to the Cronk gym, please? He said, yes, no problem. And he takes me to a place. And he said, oh, he said, the Cronk gym's closed down. I was like, really? And he was like, let me see if it's moved somewhere. So he gets on the phone, the speaker, and he speaks to someone. He says, oh, yeah, it's moved, uh, I don't know, five miles away. So he says, I'll take you there. So I never had a contact with Emmanuel Stewart. I'd spoken to him on the phone maybe a year or two before when he was working with Andy Lee in Ireland. And I just turned up out of the blue and I walked into the gym. Before I walked in, I said to the taxi driver, could you wait here, please, for 10 minutes and I'll be back out and we'll go back home if needed be. So I goes in the Cronk gym in Detroit. I walks in. Back then, I had a lot of uh, curly hair, a uh, big mop of curly hair. And I was uh, very, very handsome back then. <laughs> Not like the beast from the East that you see today. Um, so I walks in the gym and I says... Um, is Emmanuel Stewart here, please? And they go, uh, uh, Sugar Hill said to me, who are you? And I said, I'm the next heavyweight champion of the world, Tyson Fury. I said, Emmanuel's probably expecting me. And he gets on the phone to Emmanuel and he goes, Manny, he said, there's a crazy looking white dude here saying he's going to be the heavyweight champion of the world. Emmanuel said, what's his name? And he said, Tyson Fury. He said, send him to, down to me. He was in a restaurant a few miles away with uh, HBO after the meal. And I goes into the restaurant. He makes me feel very welcome. Um, he didn't know I was coming. It was just out of the blue, randomly. And he takes me back to his home and he invites me into his home. And he says, I want you to stay with me for a few weeks and we work together. Um, I, and although I just, just met him for the second time, briefly, I felt like I knew the guy for like 10 years already. And he invited me into his home. I slept in the next bedroom to ease. Uh, he bought me a giant bed, a seven foot bed to sleep in. <laughs> the next day we went down to the gym and he treated me like a world champion, even though I only had 12 fights. He would sit down and bandage my uh, hands up, wrap me up for like 40 minutes at a time. Teach me the basics, worked on uh, the jab, the right hand, the left hook, the footwork, balance. Um, we worked on basic stuff and we talked a lot as well. Um, we talked a lot of boxing. He was quite quite impressed with my uh, boxing knowledge. Excuse the kids crying. 
to apologise. <laughs> uh, yeah, we talked about a lot of uh, boxing over the years, and I, and I, I asked him a lot of questions about boxing. Um, and I was supposed to stay there for a couple of weeks. My return ticket was a couple of weeks. And he actually extended it an extra two weeks. And he said, I want you to stay for another two weeks. He said, four weeks. I said, I want to work on some stuff with you. He said, you're going to be my next heavyweight champion of the world. He said, I had a dream about a tall fighting with a long back that I was going to work with. And I never knew it was going to be a British guy. I was like, right. So we used to go down to the gym. We'd do some sparring with Jonathan Banks and some other guys. And I'd be in the ring and I'd be sparring around with these welterweights, two, three at a time. I'd say, get in, get in. Let's have a move around. Let's do some work. And then he was looking at me like, this guy is crazy. And uh, all the guys in the gym were like former world champions and stuff. And old guys sat down beside the ring. And they were like, they said, oh, we've never, we never seen anything like this. This guy is crazy. This British guy is crazy. But he's got some rhythm, uh, and it was uh, it was like what you see in one of those American movies, like coming to America or something, where all the guys from the barber shop talking and like bantering. It was absolutely amazing. It was an amazing experience for a young person to see, to see like a proper working professional world championship gym. And I remember at that time there was um, Steve Forbes was in the gym, um, Cornelius Bondage, K9. Um, who else was there? Andy Lee came after a week or so. Um, Dimitri Salita was in the gym. Um, there was quite a few uh, world champions and things in the gym at that time. And it was one of the best experiences I've had in a long time. Um, even to this day, I'll, I remember it forever. Emmanuel treat me like I was one of his own family. He'd often take, would go out like and speak to different people. He'd introduce me to people, um, boxing people. Ref, there was a referee at that time called Frank Garza. Um, I met with Frank and his wife in a hotel. Um, I, met, I met quite a lot of people that I wouldn't have never got the opportunity to meet if I had not stayed in England. Um, and he'd take me to like bar, like restaurants, and he. I'd get up and start singing on the microphone as a young kid. I went to this like Motown bar in Detroit and we'd go there and have some food and I was singing on and everyone would just get up like a karaoke sort of thing. And everyone would be getting up and singing songs. So I said to Manuel, I'm going to do it. I'm going to get up and sing a song for everybody. <laughs> so I gets the mic. I says, can I have a go? And he said, yeah, no problem. And uh, I get up and I sing, um, I sing You Look Wonderful Tonight. Uh, and everyone was up clapping. And then Manuel Eric, said, yeah. Eric Clapton. Yeah, Eric Clapton. You look wonderful tonight. And everyone was up clapping. And then they were saying to Manuel, who's this new kid? Who's this new kid? And he goes, this is, this is my next world champion. Um, and then I went back home. I had uh, Paris was, we had our first child, newborn at the time, Venezuela. Um, and I, had to, I couldn't just stay in America because um, I had a wife at home to feed and look after. So I had to go back to the UK to, to, to look after my family. And when I got back, I was home for about three weeks and I get a phone call from Emmanuel. Um, and he said, would you come over to Klitschko's camp and you can work with me there. We will work um, in Klitschko camp. So I said, yeah, no problem. So I goes over there with my cousin, Huey. He was only a young kid, 14 years old at the time. He was boxing as well. So I took Huey over there for the experience. We went there. And we'd be working out with all the guys in the gym. I never did any sparring with Vladimir at the time because he was fighting Derek Chisora at that, that fight. And he was obviously a lot smaller than me, so it was too big. So me and Emmanuel would work out. And we'd talk about things. He'd ask me my advice on what about Vlad uh, Vladimir and stuff like that. And then we ended up going to... I had a fight uh, come up on the undercard of uh, Bernard Hopkins versus Jean Pascal in Quebec City. And they act I remember actually seeing the WBC diamond belt for the first time ever back then in uh, what year it was. It could have been 2009. Um, 2009 uh, or 10, yeah. Yes. Uh, I know it was It was made for the, the fight with Hopkins and Pascal um, right. for Quebec City, Pepsi Coliseum, Quebec City. And I boxed on the undercard and my buddy, Adam Harris, he picked up the belt. I don't know how he got it, but we had the belt in the back of his car and we were delivering it to Yvonne Michel for the um, promotion. And I was looking at this belt and I was thinking, 
I've got to get one of these green belts someday. I've got to get one of these belts. And it was an amazing belt. Um, and Emmanuel was in the corner for that fight. He flew in from, from uh, Austria and he flew into Quebec City on the day of the fight. And he came into the changing room. He had a Hawaiian shirt on, a pair of linen trousers. He didn't bring no gear with him at all. And he's like, where's my fighter? Where's my fighter? I was like, I'm here, Emmanuel. And every, I, I said, who's got the mitts? Who's got the mitts? Who's got the bandages? Who's got the wraps? Who's got the scissors? Oh, it was absolutely hilarious. And we went out there and he was in the corner. Um, and him being in the corner, it, it was also almost like a, a confidence booster. And the information that he gave me was so crystal clear and um, short to follow, easy to follow. And we, uh, from that, after that fight, Emmanuel wanted me to go to Detroit and train with him and follow him around, like with his commitments with HBO and, and Klitschko and fly to Germany and all over the world. And at that time, I, I, I couldn't do it. I wasn't in a position to, to travel up and down the world with Emmanuel and, and be away from my wife and kids um, at that time. So I, I couldn't. I said, listen, I can't, I can't do this. I have to go back home. I'm fighting in the UK. Um, I have to get fights over there. So that's where I have to base. I said, I understand. I'm only a prospect coming up. I had uh, 13 fights then. I said, I know you can't put your full time into me. I said, but hopefully in the future we'll get to work together again. And I will become heavyweight champion one day. And he said, I'd love that. Um, and that was uh, the last time I saw Emmanuel Stewart after that. And uh, he passed away, God rest his soul, uh, maybe uh, a year later. But it was very fitting that I ended up back with a Cronk Jim, back with the nephew, um, Javen Sugar Hill. Uh, and everyone said, oh, no, this is a bad idea. And um, we don't know how good this guy is. But I worked with Sugar Hill when I was in Austria. Um, he, he would take me on the pad work and, and, and talk to me about bits, bits of things when Emmanuel was busy with Vladimir and also in the Cronk gym in Detroit. So I knew he, he's, the training that he did was going to work for me for long range punching and uh, putting power into the shots with every punch. And that's why I selected uh, Sugar Hill. And it was very fitting that I became heavyweight champion under the Cronk gym, like we always said, me and Emmanuel. That, that's a great trivia. Um, there's a couple of questions. Uh, Diego Martinez, he would like to know, the, are you aware of uh, Julio Cesar Chavez? Uh, yes, Mexican what, legend fighter. Yes, and, and he fought at the Aztec Stadium in front of 136,000 crazy fans back in 1992. Um, would you ever like to fight in Mexico? Would you picture yourself fighting in, in an Aztec stadium in Mexico? I would love to fight in Mexico, 100 million percent. El Rey Gitanos would love to box <laughs> in Mexico, the biggest oh. stadium possible. You know, um, has there been a, a really a big, big, big fight there since that 1992? I know Canelo fought um, Chavez Jr. But I don't know how many tickets were sold, and I don't know if it was in Mexico or whatever. That was in Las Vegas at the like twenty thousand seat, yeah, at the yeah. T-Mobile. And no, Emmanuel, was... going back onto Emmanuel Stewart, he often told me that to become a legendary heavyweight champion, you must box in different countries. You can't just stay in a stronghold where you're from. You must travel the world and fight in places that other fighters don't fight. You look at Muhammad Ali, he travelled all over the world. He boxed in England when he was a young, young up-and-comer. He boxed in Germany. He boxed in Ireland. He boxed in Africa. He boxed all over the world. Venezuela, Philippines, everywhere. Yeah. Yes, everywhere. That's how you become legendary champion. And I don't want to be one of these champions who just sit at home and defend, 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 um, and, and not travel the world, fight and not give in. I ain't just a British champion. I'm a world champion, so I represent the world. I'm the champion of the world. Every different country, I'm their champion because I'm representing world championship boxing, the heavyweight champion of the world. So I'd, lo I'd love to box in, in all different countries. Would love to. You have your green belt, and that has 166 countries. 166 flags, that's what you represent. That's what I represent, and I'm honoured, absolutely honoured to represent all of those 166 countries. 
And how was it, uh, how did you enjoy your ring entrance with the Mexican mariachi and you being the king? Yes, it was absolutely fantastic. I had the mariachi band playing me out. I had a singer. I came in with the Mexican uh, flag. I came in dressed with the Mexican flag on my kit all over me. Um, yeah, it was absolutely fantastic. It was an epic night, especially um, in Las Vegas. I was absolutely um, thrilled with the way it all went, the reception I got from the Mexican people. Um, I, I'm honored to, to, to be able to wear the Mexican flag because I, d I didn't take wearing the Mexican flag lightly. You know, I knew I had to put on a, a warrior performance. Um, that's what I did. I ended up with 47 stitches across the top of my eye, blood squirting everywhere. And I say it was worthy. It was a worthy battle of a Mexican fighter. That was so dramatic. I mean, the cut was unbelievable. I yes. think the second round. So it, yeah. it, took, it took your heart, your Mayan heart to go out and... and yes! And I ten, ra ten rounds with a massive cut like that. It was uh, hectic. And... How does the There's Only Tyson Fury chant? How's that, well, how was that born? There's only one yes. Tyson Fury. It's very catching, isn't it? There's only one Tyson Fury. I'm on the phone, Tutti. Go up. I'm doing an interview. That's my uh, three year old son. He's going to be a boxer. He absolutely love boxing. Yes, uh, <laughs> there's only one Tyson Fury. It's a British chant. Um, before me, it was there's only one Ricky Hatton. Um, you remember when Ricky Hatton came over to Las Vegas with 20,000 fans? Uh -huh. uh, and then I adopted his song, There's Only One Tyson Fury, and the British fans and people from all over the world join in with it. It's very catchy. And it, when people sing it in a stadium or an arena, it, it echoes out, <laughs> it, it bellows out all over the arena. Okay, so we're going to wrap this up with a exercise um i'm gonna give you seven concepts okay and you're gonna create the greatest fighter in history yeah so from each concept you say which fighter applies to that so who yep. would say punch punching power who would that be punching power well deontay wilder is the biggest puncher in history of heavyweight boxing Statistically. Chin. Chin, I'd say the best chin ever um, would be Oliver McCall. Nice. Never knocked down and he let Lennox Lewis tee off on him with big uppercuts and right hands. How about the jab? The best jab of all times, I'd say, has to go to Larry Holmes. Hand speed. Hand speed, Sugar Ray Leonard. Heart. Tyson Fury. Defense. Wilfred Benitez. And overall boxing skills, gener uh, ring generalship. Ring generalship, probably have to go to Floyd Mayweather. Very good. Champ, it has been very special to have you in the WBC Talks. We, we created these uh, video conferences when the pandemic began, only to keep the boxing world communicated, entertained. And this has been a great experience. Uh, today is round 57. And well uh, we hope uh, this will go uh, and life will resume soon. But uh, in the meantime, i like to just simply say thank you for being who you are, the way you represent uh, humanity, the way you represent boxing and the WBC. Uh, we could not have a better uh, human being as the WBC heavyweight champion of the world. Absolutely. Thank you very much, guys. I'm honored to be a part of it. And I, I enjoyed my chat with you guys. Um, it, it's passed on an hour and I, I really, really enjoyed it and I wish you good luck and you're doing an absolutely fantastic thing, keeping everybody updated on boxing and keeping everybody's spirits high. Thank you, Pepe. Thank you. Very nice to see you again.
And as soon as I go to the office, I'm going to get that video clip of the of the of the dog flying by. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. God bless you all. God bless. All have a have a great weekend. The best bye of your bye. family. Bye bye. Yeah, bye. <laughs> muy bien. Gracias, gordito. Muchísimas. Estuvo muy padre. Órale. Así. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.